you very much, uh, Colonel Journey. I now, like, I now have the pleasure of introducing today's keynote speaker. If the gentleman to my right, to my right looks familiar to many of you, he should, he's been in over 40 motion pictures. If the realism that he has brought to his goals, and the realism that he's brought to me, the combat films that he has assisted in production with, it's because he learned from first-hand experience. Captain Dale Dye graduated as a cadet officer from the Missouri Military Academy and enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in January 1964. He served in Vietnam in 1965 and 1967 through 70. He is a veteran of 31 major combat operations. He emerged from the war highly decorated and seriously wounded. He was awarded three Purple Hearts, Bronze Star Medal for Valor, and at least three other valorous awards. He spent 13 years as an enlisted Marine, and by the talent he demonstrated, he was offered the opportunity to attend Officer Candidate School, and he did so, and went on to serve in a variety of roles as an officer in the Marine Corps before he retired. When he retired, he became a successful businessman. He is the founder of, of Warriors Inc., the leading military consultancy firm to motion pictures and television. This firm has worked in more than 50 movies and TV shows, some of which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, Platoon, uh, Saving Private Ryan, and the, uh, the series Band of Brothers. He and his firm have worked closely with directors and actors on almost every major combat film come out of Hollywood in the last 22 years. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to introduce a very successful businessman, and more important than that, a courageous Marine. Leave it to a general officer to overstate the case, but thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, my brothers and sisters who share with me the distinction of being among America's number of, every dwindling number of uh, Vietnam veterans, thank you for having me here today. I guess getting me sometimes is a lot like herding cats, and, uh, but they managed to herd this cat into a corner, and, uh, and here I am today. It is uh, a great honor, and I'm humbled to stand with you today before this great memorial that we have all simply come to know as the wall. For some of you, I imagine it's your first visit. If that's the case, I don't imagine it'll be your last. For others, it's a familiar sojourn, another opportunity to come and visit with familiar names that are engraved on that black marble. I've been here many times sometimes with fellow survivors from my units in Vietnam, and other times by myself, where I can spend some more personal time with the memories of men who I knew and loved, and whose only legacy is a single line among more than 58,000 lines on that wall. You see, for those of us who understand the importance of this great memorial to our nation and to a generation of veterans who had to fight two wars, one in the jungles, the mountains, the rice paddies of Vietnam, and another war here at home for recognition and for respect among a population divided by political controversy. So for those of us who experienced that, this is hallowed ground. And like all special places, all holy places to us, we approach it with great respect. And I think we approach it with a certain trepidation, a certain sense that 
even us, those of us who served and survived are somehow just not worthy to stand in the shadows of those who paid the ultimate price when they were called to serve their nation. I recall distinctly how nervous, frightened I was to come here myself. In fact, I never got here until a full decade after this memorial was dedicated. My first visit happened on a day in 1994. I was serving as the military advisor to the cast and crew of a movie called Forrest Gump. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, we, were, we were shooting scenes of anti-war protesters right over here by the reflecting pool. And as I told the cast and crew about how turbulent those times were from my own experience, because of all things, after three tours in Vietnam, they sent me right here to Washington. Perfect. <laughs> so as I was telling them about this, one of the crew dogs, who was himself a Vietnam veteran, came to me and he said, hey, pointed in the distance, he said, have you been over to the wall? And I said, no, I, uh, I think that's too painful. I, there's a lot of names on that wall of dead men that are still alive in my memories. Well, nothing much more was said. Until the next day, at lunchtime, when I was surrounded by a contingent of cast and crew, including the star of our show, Forrest Gump himself, Tom Hanks. And they got me by the elbows, and they marched me over here to this wall. And then they stood by silently, and respectfully while I made that pilgrimage. I can't describe for you, I just don't have the words to tell you the emotions that raged through me on that day. Those of you who've had your own first visit experience don't need me to tell you about that anyway. I thought a lot about that visit and all the other visits that followed subsequently every time business brought me here to Washington. And here's what I've learned. For those of us who served in Vietnam and survived, visiting this memorial carries a tremendous emotional impact. And that impact goes well beyond just remembering reliving part of our past, reliving a bit of our misspent youth, whispering a prayer for someone we knew, or whispering a prayer for all the ones we didn't know, but who shared in common with us service in a long, bloody, and brutal war. I think I know why this memorial has such a tremendous impact on us. And frankly, it lies right in that polished marble surface that our Park Service keeps so nice. You see, as we stand there reading the names of our honored dead, for those of us who served and survived, there is a whisper in the air. And that whisper says, it could have been me. And if we're grieving for someone that we knew personally, that we knew and loved when he was killed, sometimes that whisper is, it should have been me. You see, the answer lies in that polished black surface that is so striking and so unique among all of America's war memorials. Because as we stand in front of this memorial, we see our reflection. And it's as though we're there again. It's as though we're standing once again in ranks with our honored dead. It's as though we're humping the boonies in the Badlands, just as we did in Vietnam, with them again. As though we're once again with our brothers and sisters, marching as a tight, tough outfit toward that inevitable muster at the last firebase. 
The Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund is trying to expand on that experience. For those of us who survived, for the families of those who were killed, for our families, and for the millions of people who visit this memorial from around the world because they're trying to honor Vietnam veterans who were so often dishonored when they returned home. We must support that effort, just as we must dedicate ourselves to ensuring that no other generation of American veterans returning from difficult, controversial wars in the Middle East and elsewhere around the globe ever experience the ignoble return home that we did. At times like this, I, uh, I like to think about the Lincoln Memorial. I like to reflect on President Abraham Lincoln. I like to think about the words that he said at Gettysburg in 1863, because they're as appropriate here today as they were when he spoke them at Gettysburg. They're appropriate because the people who sacrificed and gave it all in Vietnam, they did that to preserve liberty and freedom for the people of South Vietnam. So they're as appropriate now as they were during the dark days of our own Civil War. Lincoln alluded to the unfinished business that Civil War veterans had become, had begun in service to their nation. He said that those honored dead gave the last full measure of devotion. And so did everyone of the veterans on that wall. We must never forget that. And we must never forget what else Lincoln said in closing the Gettysburg Address. And he said, we must highly resolve that these honored dead shall not have died in vain. And that there will be in this nation under God a new birth of freedom. There will be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Those are high ideas. For such ideals and for such concepts, that's why we serve. That's why our men and women serve today. That's why it is sometimes necessary for us to die. We need to remember that. And we need to remember every day that we draw breath in this greatest nation on earth, that it's because of the service and sacrifice of our veterans, the people who are listed on this wall. <laughs> Folks, you've been terrific uh, for giving me your time and attention during all this heat. I feel like I'm in a Baptist church service with all this heat. <laughs> I know it's hot. But what I respect is the heat that's in your belly and in your heart because you're here, because you understand. I thank you for that. And I wish you... I'll be right Without taking any longer than I should, I wish you a very, very happy and thoughtful Memorial Day. Thanks for having me with you.